Hey everyone, it's Katrina Sawa here, the Jumpstart Your Biz Coach with jumpstartyourmarketing.com and I am talking to my friend Michelle Villalobos today with Superstar Activator. Say hi, Michelle. Hello. <laughs> and we got together like a couple weeks ago and we're chatting up and we said we need, we both do live events. We do big ones and we do little ones. We sell high end, we sell low end. And we wanted to bring you some of our super secret tips today. Um, anything you share, wanted to share about why we're here today, uh, Michelle, before we get started? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, for me, I'm one of those people, like a lot of us probably here, that love to share what I've learned and really enjoy pat paying it forward. And so events have been such a beautiful revenue stream for my business you know financially they're awesome but also like emotionally and spiritually they're very fulfilling so um it just seemed like a fun thing to do to get together and and share some of the things that we've learned along the way yeah and i appreciate that um so we were right on the same page because we do like to give content to people we do like to um, share what we know. Of course, we can't sit here for three days like we would normally do in our own events, right? To tell you every little thing. But we want to give you some juicy nuggets for those of you who are thinking about doing a live event or a retreat, um, even a destination event, uh, one day, a two hour, a three day, a week long. It doesn't matter. There's some really cool things that you need to know, right? That's right. Woohoo! Let's do it. So before we dive into the secrets and what you're going to learn, they may not know about you, you people that are following you may not know about me, why don't you share a little bit about what you do, and okay. yeah, and then I'll tell what I do. Sounds good. So I've been in business for 11 years, and the first seven and a half of those years were pretty miserable. Um, and I was doing events back then. It's not like I discovered events and then my business changed, but I did d events super differently back then. Back then, I was trying to make my events, I was trying to monetize my events solely and strictly through sponsorship and ticket sales, which meant that I had to have huge events. And, um, and while those were really profitable, really fulfilling, what shifted for me was a, a desire to have my life feel and look different, like from a lifestyle perspective. So about four and a half years ago, I switched my, my focus from these big events and started to migrate towards retreats and events, retreats and small events, more intimate events. And it was a game changer. And now we're, we're helping other, our clients learn how to use small events too. And there's still room and we still do larger events. But as you'll learn through this Facebook live a little later, we do them with, with a new mentality and a new, um, strategy. So there's definitely room for both small and large events in our business model. And it's just a question of how we structure it so that it all kind of fits together and is energy rich at the end of the day. Right, energy rich, and they don't kick you in your butt, and you have to take a week off of work because they uh, take so much out of you, right? Oh, I used to joke that they used to shave years off the end of my life. I was pretty <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, and you like to be on stage or don't like to be on stage, I think events could be good for you in your business. They actually... You know, I've been doing my business for 16 years now, and uh, before that, working with small businesses as well, and I love being in the spotlight. So I, I have no problem being in the spotlight, but in the beginning, I was super lame at it, okay? So I was so lame at getting started speaking, and that's just when I had a speaking gig and stuff. Um, and doing my own events, though, I got some major coaching before I launched my first event. I mean, I spent a lot of money on that first event because I wanted to do it right and get perfect. And now, honestly, I give a ton of still great, but I don't do that much prep anymore because I have the confidence in my content now. So it does get easier. You don't have to be the perfect control freak person uh, <laughs> um, to make a really successful event because uh, but so what I do is I help people monetize more of what they're doing in general so whether you want to do events or you need to figure out what you're selling in the back end or you want to speak more become an author um, I have lots of books behind me those are all my books and another one coming out this fall and so I love helping people you know really be that expert in your industry to get more confidence in what you do so you can charge more, do the high-end programs, leap out on stages, 
and um, all the little minutia of the how to get it all done. So like doing this Facebook Live and getting it on with our little things on it and everything and how to do all of the little things that you need to do. I love showing people the how. So that's what I do in my business. Um, so we have tons to share. So <sighs> where to get started? Who I want to know, like from people that are watching, like what kind of events do you want to host or are you hosting? I know that some of you are on the line, Samantha, Jake, Joanne, thank you for coming. I know at least two out of the three, maybe all three of you already do live events. Uh, so would love to know what maybe challenges you're having. So make sure you pop in questions and challenges to the post. Um, but why don't you get started, Michelle, with telling them a little bit about um, what kind, you know, the types of different events that we're thinking. So, so there's really like, the, I, I kind of separate them into two types of events, large events and small events. And then I know that there are, you know, first of all, there's no defining feet, defining line between large and small. But, um, but that's kind of how I figured we, we might structure this conversation because for me, it was like large came first and then I started doing small. And, and I think it's, you know, it's, it's relevant and important to kind of look at what are the pros and cons of each, right? So from a large event perspective and Katrina, I think that you'll be able to really add value here. Like there's something to be said for gathering a lot of people together with all that energy. Like you see Tony Robbins do it. You see Brendan Burchard do it. You see all the big heavies, you know, in our industry, in the coaching and speaking world, creating these massive events and they're so profitable. And they're, you know, there's something to be said for the magic that ensues when you gather all those people together. And, and the beauty of large events is really in the leverage, right? You put all this effort and time into this one thing, but you can also pack a lot of people and a lot of opportunity into this one thing. So with a large event, you know, you've got lots of sponsorship opportunities. You can make money on ticket sales. And also you can, I think, much easier in a large format event, you know, you can charge a little bit less per person to get them in the door. And then you can look at opportunities to monetize once they're there. So, um, so another thing that, that makes events, large events so great is also that there's just, there's so many different revenue opportunities, like sponsorship is such a big one. Katrina, would you agree? Yeah. And I used to do a lot more sponsorships than I do now, although I'm looking to ramp that back up again because I keep forgetting to work on that. And I think that's a big mistake that a lot of times people do when they do an event is they think, oh, well, there's only going to be like 20 people. Nobody's going to want to sponsor that event. Or, oh, it's only five people. Or, oh, whatever the limiting belief is, put in the excuse to not go after a sponsor. But you'd be surprised. I mean, I've made seven to $8,000 from a four-person event. So just from selling coaching and stuff in the back end. So there's, it's funny though, because you started with big events and now you're moving to small events. I'm, I've been trying to get, honestly, I mean, this is real. I've been trying to get over a hundred thousand or a hundred thousand. I wish I, over a hundred people in the room at the same time. The only event I've ever done over a hundred, it was about 150 people was my, my first one day event. That was a multi-speaker thing though. When I, before I did my own three day training and uh, that was a good event, but nobody really sold anything because it wasn't it wasn't positioned. I wasn't positioned well enough at that event because I was so new and I didn't get any coaching yeah. for it. I, went, I had a huge hotel bill. I went to a really nice swanky oh, hotel. I, I spent money on all the food and lunch. Yeah. And yeah. Oh my God. And I, I think I was ten thousand dollars in the hole. Yeah, that. and I'm not surprised. Like you know, I started. So the first seven and a half years, I, I told you, were, were difficult. I started doing my Women's Success Summit in 2010. And I think, I, you know, I, I barely broke even for the first, you know, few of them. And then when I did make money, it was so little. Like, for all that effort and all that time that I put into it, I didn't make all that money, you know, all that much money. And I think that that ultimately that was part of why I got burnt out because I didn't know what I was doing really. Um, I have a client, her name's Carla Merrill, and I think she might even be on here. And she's she's a genius when it comes to monetizing large events. And if I'd known her back then, the story might have been different. But because of how I 
did it like you. Like I, I was scared to get up and make an offer. I felt like I, you know, I didn't want to sell at my event. I was like very adamant that this is a no pitch zone. And I, I, you know, I was really worried that people wouldn't like me if I tried to sell stuff. So I really missed out. I think now, like I just, you know, and, and I don't have regret, but I think about all the money I left on the table and more importantly, right? More importantly, all the people that probably would have wanted to keep working with me that probably would have gotten value from something had I offered it that didn't like I left all those opportunities. I let them go. And so for me, I got burnt out on the large events because I didn't really know how to monetize them very effectively in the beginning. Towards the end, I figured it out and I started making an offer for, for my programs. And that's and what I started doing, interestingly, was making an offer at the big event to come into a small event and come into the retreats. And that's where I had the aha moment, like, wow, I really enjoy these small events more. I really like, not more, like in a different way. I, right. I didn't have as much anxiety leading up to them. There wasn't so much nervousness about things falling apart or about that huge hotel bill. So for me, I, you know, I, I thought back, like if I could do it all over again, I would have started with the small events because they're so profitable and, and they're less stressful. And that doesn't mean we don't do the larger events anymore. We do, but we really do them as, as a feeder into our smaller events with a lot less pressure to make the big sales on the front end and more looking at what's the opportunity on the back end. Does that make sense? Yeah, and you bring up a good point is the back end. A lot of times when people do their own live events, they think about that initial ticket sale. They want to put money in their pocket, right? And they think, oh, I'm going to do a live event. I'm going to sell a bunch of tickets and I'm going to make money. Well, I don't usually make money on my ticket price, frankly. You know, Now, if you're going to do a smaller event, you're talking retreats, that's a higher ticket price. If you're talking yeah. destination event, then yeah, you might have a higher ticket price, but also you're paying for um, retreat centers or travel and hotels and all kinds of stuff over there. Exactly. So. Well, and one of the misconceptions people have with retreats is that you have to provide accommodations and food. Yeah. Um, there are retreats where that makes sense. And in fact, we even have a client whose specialty is in providing catering for retreats. Her name is Helena Iturrialde. She's on my, on my Facebook. And at the same time, like, you know, you don't have to do that, especially not off the bat. If you're getting started, it might make more sense. And, and this is what we do. And our retreats are fabulous. We like to let people go out for lunch. We like to host our events in a place where, you know, they can go back home or they can go to their hotel room. Like we don't cover those costs. You don't have to. No. As long as you're delivering a really fantastic outcome that they really want. The, the first initial retreat, what we call an immersion, an, an introductory immersion or an intro retreat, those are to get people in the door. And then the real key to make retreats as a model super profitable is, again, that big back end that we talked about earlier. Like what comes after? What comes next? Once you deliver that wow outcome and experience, there's always a new problem to be solved. How can you be the person that helps them solve that new problem? And you just hit on the mark. Like that is what you have to think about when you're when you're trying to do a live event or you want to do a live event. You have to think, OK, so what's the problem I'm solving at the live event? Yes. And then what problem am I leaving them with yes. it at that event that they have to now work with me on the back end or at this other thing? to solve that next problem. So we don't want to not give them content. Of course no. we want to give them content and provide the transformation or the outcome that you're promising for that particular event. Yes. And you need to leave them with the next problem. Well, well and the thing is, the, the one kind of distinction I'll make, because that's 100% true, and I just want to presence the fact that it's not like you're being manipulative. It's no. not like you're saying, oh, I'm going to solve this problem, but I'm going to leave them with this other problem that only right. I can fix. Like, right. Yeah. It's not that. It's that there's only so much you can do in yeah. a three day event. Well, right? and most people there's say, always, what? Most people say, I don't have enough content to teach a three day. I'm just going to do a one day. But every single time I talk to them, they have all this stuff they want to cover in one day. And I'm like, oh my God, that's too much for even a three day event. And I've had to learn this lesson the hard way. I've had coaches and mentors say, nope, get rid of this, get rid of this content. You've got to pare it down to these three things. And I'm like, how can I talk about 
just three simple things, one thing a day. I'm like, seriously? But you can. And I still give way too much. People call my events sometimes a fire hose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and, and one, one phrase that I like to drill into my clients, which sounds really aggressive, but it's not, is that information is not transformation. Right. Information is not transformation. Like, yeah. there is only so much you can like you it's not about content it's really not about content i mean the right. content is a framework it's it's essential to there might be a piece of content but what really shifts people is integration it's taking right. that content and applying it making decisions and that takes time it doesn't happen you know you can't do 12 different like in three days you can pretty much do about 12 to 15 modules is what we've discovered 90 minute modules with 30 minute breaks with lunch 12 to 15 okay every single one of those modules can't be a content decision integration it's just too much so right. you got to get really clear like what's the foundational program what's the foundational content that will have them have the most massive shift and transformation and then what comes on the back end of that? What comes next? And right. that's the ongoing mastery piece. You can't master something in three days. You can make a shift, you can transform, you can have an awakening, you can make a decision, you can shift your business model. There's a lot you can do in three days, but to have a, a long-term ongoing transformation, that takes time and that's the big back end. Let's go to some of these questions. I know we have a couple things. I have to put my glasses on. I can't see. Um, thanks for being here, everybody. Nancy Matthews is in the house. Uh, Samantha Wilson. Amanda Rawls. Hey, Lisa look how Jake's here. Hey, Jake. Carla Merrill. You mentioned her. He yeah. showed up. Christy Uwichku. Nancy. Yeah, Nancy. She's had a big event coming up here. Yeah, Nancy time. knows about big events for sure. I know. I'm going to be there. If anybody's going to Orlando in a couple weeks, they'll see me there. Um, okay, so some, let's see. Samantha says, a silly fear, but being live in front of people and being criticized publicly and not knowing an answer. Well, that's easy, Samantha. I mean, you can't expect to know every answer on the spot. What you just say is, well, that's a great question. Let me look into that for you. Or that's not something I cover. Or I have power partners who usually cover that thing, and I can find out more for you. You can always follow up with them later for one thing. What would you say to that? Yeah, I just so feel you here, Samantha, this feeling of um, not just like not knowing the answer, but for me what has always shown up is like just that that being criticized, you know, yeah. in general. Like I get even a little bit emotional just the feeling into your question. Um, and I'll, I'm gonna take like a more, a different approach. Like I agree with everything that Katrina says and I believe that there's work you can do for your mindset to start to really step into, you know, self-expression as a leader. I mean, if you if you wanna be a leader, you, that you know this, right? I don't, probably don't have to tell you this. You're gonna have to be okay with being criticized. And so rather than figuring out how to, how to deter criticism or avoid it, it's more like how can you become resilient enough to be with it and yeah. to receive it and just be like, okay, you know, I get you. And I'm, and you know, still prepare and do all the things you need to do to become better, but also know that the more you step into leadership and self-expression, especially when you're doing it on stuff that matters and that's polemic and that's divisive or that, you know, it, where you have a point of a, where you have a perspective and a point of view, you know, it's better if you have some haters. It's better if you have people that don't agree with you because that really shows that you're showing up with something important and meaningful and valuable and different. So, you know, it's the two things. It's one, like how to, how to stem the, how to, how to avoid it and how to be better, but also how to be with it. And so for that, I would say, you know, I do a lot of internal work before I go up on stage. I do visualizations, I do breathing exercises, you know, and I, I really, one of the best things that I ever learned how to do, um, Carla knows this, we've talked about this, was to like, before going on about 20 minutes before like really getting still and present into my heart and imagine sending love out to the audience and then imagining receiving love back and i know that sounds super woo woo and maybe a little cheesy but you'd be surprised how that helps you show up in a new way yeah i just linked to one of my i just wrote a post about this the other day i think it was 
two days ago too is um, someone I know. I won't mention who, uh, but I, put, I I was wanting to help this person because they were being attacked, so to speak, and there was not their fault, and it wasn't a speaking situation. But the same thing still applies. Is like you have to learn how to develop that hard shells, so to speak. Um, we do want to take criticism. We do want to take feedback, of course. Um, but when it comes to people not being nice or um, saying something bad against your character when you know it's not true, I always tell people, you know, like, look, most people, that person is probably not happy in their life. <laughs> like, seriously, so they're lashing out, right? And you have to just learn how to let it go because they could be in a spot right now where, who knows, their kid could be in the hospital. They could just be going through a divorce, the husband just cheated on them. I mean, and they're lashing out at something because whatever, it's just check it out. Yeah. So let's see, we have another cool question. Samantha says, I love it. Thank you. And um, let's see, Christy, you have an event coming up in October also. You guys should post your events in here. Nancy Matthews, post your event, girlfriend. Uh, let's see. Joanne Newduck says, I do a large women's group expo and martini party, not conference style. So it's more of a mixer then, I'm guessing, with an ex with vendor tables. Um, and maybe you're not monetizing it enough. She said, I want to monetize that more. So that would be a structure question, right, I think. And how else can you monetize it? But could you add something to the structure, number one, like a little – mini speaker breakouts or something like yeah. that basically, that can um, not only get other people, quote unquote, the speakers uh, to promote it for you to get more people there, but also right. to um, add a different flair to the group. Because sometimes when you go, I do a lot of networking. I go to a lot of events. If I go to an event that's just a mixer and an expo, if there's not that much stuff that I'm interested in, I'm in and out of there in 20, 30 minutes. Okay. Mm. Um, but if there's some exercises, like Michelle was saying, with um, getting people involved, implementing an engagement, if you do little games or exercises yeah. or get people on the mic every 20 minutes to get people engaging, then you can keep people longer. You can also, you know, come up with different income streams around that. Yeah, my, my, one of my clients, Ariane uh, Traverso, Ari Ohm, she goes by on Facebook, she's a yoga guru and an also you know internet marketer and she put together something called the yoga expo and there they had some speakers in breakout rooms and also in the expo area they had like i think it was one maybe two or three like stages where they would have little activities going on maybe 15 20 people at a time gathering and so they had a, a published schedule like at 120 Go to this stage and do, um, you know, a chakra balancing thing. Uh, so then they, they just had that all the way through. And I agree with Katrina that that's a way to keep people there longer, which is what your sponsors would want. And obviously, if you have an expo, I'm pretty sure you're doing expo table sponsorships. But so if you are, that's something that you can show your, your sponsors. Like, look what I'm doing to help you keep the people engaged. And maybe you can charge an upcharge for a sponsor that wants to host one of those activities. So you get an expo table for 500, but you get an expo plus an activity for 1,000 or 1,500. So you can kind of play with, you know, higher level of, of sponsorship in order to have more access intimately with, with people. And Joanne said- Okay, that's awesome. She's already doing all this. That's great. Entertainment. Um, and so like I'm a part of the Sacramento Women's Expo. I always uh, almost always speak at that event and I have an exhibitor booth as well. And there's hundreds of vendor booths, probably a couple hundred plus uh, it's a six hour thing. And so I know that mostly she makes her money through the vendor booths and the sponsorships and sponsorships, though, can be, I mean, a lot of money. So if you get some banks or some different things in there. Uh, Our, get, automotive is a big industry, yeah. especially for women's events now. Um, jewelry but, is big, watches. But think $1,000 sponsorships. Think $20,000 sponsorships, not 400 or 1,000, right? So that's where you'd want to look at that. Um, it, it For that kind of a vendor event, obviously you're not going to sell like a big mastermind or a retreat or something like that. 
But you can, I mean, you can really focus on the attendees in a way, as long as you're targeting the attendees as a certain industry, if you can sell something to those attendees after the fact, don't forget the follow-up email. I mean, the one thing that's different uh, with my Sacramento Women's Expo gal, she's, no offense to Karish, I love her, uh, and she's very focused on doing these expos, but she doesn't follow up throughout the year. She doesn't follow up, she doesn't have other things to sell. She, she could easily do trainings for vendors, she could do all these different things um, that I, off I offered to do a training, and I did a training for some of her vendors. So there's opportunity for her to sell them additional things throughout the year, but she doesn't. So it's just a matter sometimes of brainstorming with someone like me or Michelle or somebody who can give you those ideas and then show you how to plot them out and make them come true so you have different income streams. And another interesting idea, maybe for you, Joanne, perhaps, um, it brings to mind that one time we had a sponsor, it was um, Cardigo, and they were trying to enter the Miami market, and their goal for sponsoring our event was to get people to register for Cardigo. On the other hand, I had a speaker who had like 200 books left over from a, an event thing that he did, and they were taking up space in his garage, and he's a great speaker. And so what we did was we said, all right, Cardigo, for everyone that registered, so this guy's keynoting our event. So he's going to, once people keynote the event, like everybody wants a, their book, right? So he, he was willing to give us these books. So we told Cardigo, what we'll do is for everyone that registers, he'll give a book signed by him. So it basically, he got rid of all those 200 books and they got 200 plus registrations at our event and their goal had been 50. So yeah. you can kind of figure out ways to cross promote between your sponsors and among your sponsors to add value. You know what's so funny, Michelle, is you just gave me a really good idea and I wonder if Nancy is still watching because <laughs> since I'm going to this event in Orlando, I mean, I can put things in the goodie bag if I want to. I'm one of the speakers and sponsors, but it's 300 thi things, right? And you don't want to just put a piece of paper in a goodie bag. So I'm going to give away one of my books like in the goodie bag. That's a big chunk of change, right? If yeah. I want to put in 300 books. Well, I can get a sponsor to pay for that and stick the sponsor flyer in the middle. Duh, I'm having a duh right now. I'm going to do that later. Yay. <laughs> if anyone wants to be that sponsor and get in front of Nancy's 300 women entrepreneurs. There you go. That's brilliant. You help me pay for the getting the books there, and I will throw something in for you too. So, <laughs> Yay. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm sorry. This is what happens with brainstorming. Whether That's you're right, man. Or, I mean, Okay. So lots of great advice, everybody's saying, that's awesome. Um, Christy says, I look forward to a fabulous event. Hope to see you there. She has a Rock Your Brilliance event coming up. It's on Eventbrite. And Joanne's is uh, in April next year. So that's awesome. Okay, well, we could talk for hours and hours and hours. And I'm trying to think if there's anything. Well, I'd like, to, I'd like to touch a little bit now, maybe on small events, on retreats. You know, especially the retreat model, I, I think it's worth considering, especially if you already feel pretty comfortable with doing large events, mm -hmm. consider, you know, a small event, like an, a retreat style event, three days, but at a higher price point. You know, a lot of times people think, oh, you know, I don't want to, people struggle sometimes in the beginning with like the idea of a, of a $1,500 or a $2,000 ticket price for a three day event. But what I'll say is that there's generally in any audience of people, there's always 10 to 15% of those people that are willing to pay more for a more valuable experience, for a more intimate experience. So if you're already doing big events and you feel really comfortable with those, consider potentially taking people from the bigger event, putting them into a small or trying to do a retreat model you know, on its own. I, I found that it's a really easy, user-friendly, lifestyle-friendly business model that that you know from the retreats you know our conversion rates are so much higher than they ever were at our large events because people have a much more bonded intimate experience and they generally pay more to be in the room so they're more committed up front so that's just something i want to put in people's it put their that this bug in your ear the the idea that you know they don't have to all be large events and you can mix it up and you can try this retreat model which i think is just so so easy and fun. One thing that's really cool about doing small retreats, and I've done a lot of retreats mostly for my mastermind group. So when they are a part of my high-end mastermind, we 
I used to, I haven't lately, and I'm looking to do it again next year, but we used to go on location. So we've gone to Virginia Beach, wow. for days, New York City, Tucson, Arizona to a spa and all kinds of different places. So it's kind of fun. Um, and I'm even looking at doing a cruise next year. So whether they're already a client and it's part of the program yeah. or you're trying to get them into a program and you want to do a retreat, um, I've worked with a lot of clients also on helping to plan this where you um, you have to just decide, you know, first of all, where do you want to go? Where do you want to go? You can stay home and you can stay local if you want to. But if you want to travel, I have one client who travels all over the place. I'm like, why aren't you doing life coaching retreats or some kind of retreat when you're going to these places? Because then you can write off the majority all of the it. expenses and right you get to take these vacations with people you love, you know, assuming you love your clients, which I would We're not tax specialists or attorneys or CPAs, just throwing that out there. But you can write off a lot of stuff when you are doing something with uh, clients or prospects around the world. So figure out where you want to go. Pick one or two places and start planning those retreats. Well, I would say my advice, what I've seen and observed with our clients too, is that it's easier and generally more lucrative to start and do your introductory immersions, the ones that bring people in the door, to keep them somewhere local, keep yes. them inexpensive, keep them easy. And then, you know, once you know that you have people in the room, deliver a massively valuable experience and, and they, they've traveled or they've participated in a three day, then they know the magic of it. And then in your back end program, having retreats is a great fulfillment. And that's usually where I recommend go on a trip. That's what we do. So our opening retreats are generally in Miami, which is kind of our home base. We also do two a year in Denver. But then once they're in our program, part of the delivery of the program is we go to the more exotic locations, yes. um, Colorado, Asheville, you know, places like that. So that's what I would recommend. You know, yeah. I feel like sometimes people get sucked into an, uh, this sense of a retreat. It has to be somewhere exotic. It has to be somewhere beautiful. And then they commit to this venue and hotel rooms. And, oh, and that can be just as stressful as doing, you know, a big event and committing to, to, to that sort of thing. So I feel like the better solution, especially if you're just starting out, is do it local, deliver massive value. I mean, I've delivered retreats in my friend's upstairs of my friend's gym i've delivered retreats in a in a hotel suite like you don't have to do it in a proper venue you can be more creative because it's a smaller event right i've done them mostly in hotel suites myself especially if there's seven or eight people you can get a really big suite like you go to vegas you can get for 300 bucks a night and you can get out a day yeah exactly um, yes i agree if, and if you don't have a large following yet then what you should be focusing on is list building you should be focusing on list building and talking and nurturing to your list and then maybe do some local ones first as inexpensive as possible please however i will say that i've done i've spent a hundred thousand dollars on a three four day event before and i've spent a thousand dollars on a three-day event before and the hundred thousand dollar event outsold by it sold a hundred thousand dollars the thousand dollars sold nothing okay so be careful with doing nothing no investment in your training on what to do uh, help and support and marketing and all that kind of stuff be careful investing nothing um, versus too much. Now you don't want too much, but um, now just so you know, for like three days events, people are like, "Well, how much do you spend, Katrina?" Well, I'm probably looking at tripling the cost actually for me next year because of the venue that I'm going to move to. But typically, I'm spending around fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars to actually put on my three day event. Just an FYI. So it doesn't have to cost a lot, but yeah, in the beginning, I didn't have that money sitting around in my bank account. I had, I was kind of freaked out. I hope the, the hotel bill didn't come until some of the sales came through at the end. And I was crossing my fingers that they wouldn't, you know, they would pass by okay in my bank account. All right. So in the beginning, it's, it was like that. And, but I just trusted that it was all going to work itself out. You have to trust and believe that you're going to make some sales. And if you do your job well, you will. I know you will. Mm -hmm. Yay. Yay. Okay. So we talked about large events, small events. 
We talked about uh, hosting, planning, designing, and filling to a certain extent. There's so many ways to fill an event. Um, I another couple ways I would say I would say the easiest way to fill an event is to go to other events. Wouldn't you agree to that? Like in person. Yeah, well, and I think that um, you know this is an under uh, appreciated strategy that is our number one strategy, and that is to get on the phone with people. Yeah. And to invite them and to, you know, really use, use, you know, getting on the phone. And, and a lot of people, I know I resist that. And we want to automate everything. We want them to go to our website and just sign up. And that's great. But especially if you're doing like a smaller event with a higher price point, chances are you're going to need to handhold people a little more to get them in. And so I would say one of the key skills for filling an event is really knowing how to enroll people in that event and, and really getting clarity on what is the what is the outcome of the event? What is the promise of the event? What can you truly say you're going to get out of this? And if you can have two or three really compelling things and help people on the journey to understand how those things apply to them in their business, then getting on the phone is a really powerful way of, of, of signing people up. And it's the number one strategy that, that we find works. Yes. The phone is amazing. I would agree with that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, gosh, I mean, we could talk about so many and more things. One more thing I'll say is bring a friend, like anybody who signs up getting, we have somebody call them up to see if they want to bring a friend. So the yeah. phone, and then also like the people who are re registering focus on them and seeing who else they know. Yeah. That'll help for sure. I have a lot of people that return back and then bring somebody the next time and so on. So, and focus on repeat people too. So they're, they're a big stream. Um, pricing and offers is all over the board. Uh, I know there's people out there that do free scholarships, free tickets, that kind of thing. What's your take on free tickets, Michelle? You know <laughs> we've done it. We've done it. And we've especially done it when we're down to the wire a week or two before the event and we haven't filled it up. And I'm talking about the bigger events. And we've certainly given away tickets. And guess what? Those people generally don't end up buying. They generally uh, don't sometimes don't show up They or they leave early or they're on their phone the whole time. You know, honestly, what I can say truly from experience now is that when people don't invest, they don't commit generally. Um, it's not a hundred percent true, but it's true eighty percent of the time at least. And so I would say that you know I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan. We for years we did this thing called a one dollar, uh, where we would basically charge them a dollar, and if they didn't show up, we would we would charge the card, um, and that worked pretty well. That worked better than the free for sure. But now yeah. we're just like we're putting a price on it, and we sometimes offer special discounts like coupon codes if they come through a friend or something like that. But I'm, I'm leaning towards now, the more I know and the more confident I get, it's like, you know what, if you want it, you'll pay for it. And, yeah. and just make it a no brainer price point, you know, where it's just really easy for you to stand in the value of that price. Yeah, this is the pricing of events has been a struggle for me this whole time, because I know how much stuff I give, I know how much people get, and how much clarity and understanding and training and what they walk away with just in the binder alone is um, probably worth thousands of dollars, but you can't charge thousands. Although my very first event, I did charge a thousand dollars and I did get it for, but that was back in 2009, okay? So it's just different now. I well, would it's, if it's different too, depending on the the, the sales process. And because our event is, our, our base event is 2,500, our, right. our, our, our three day retreat. And that to some people sounds outrageous, but when it's in the context of a conversation that's about what they really need and what they're going to get, you know, we fill it up. We we're right. full now for one that we have two weeks away. Right. So if you want a price tag that's like that, you yeah. definitely have to be on the phone. You have totally. to be on the phone for that. You cannot totally. just click. It. They're not going to click and buy that. No, no really. Way. I mean, maybe if you're Tony Robbins or something. Yeah. Not even. He still sells through live events. So. <laughs> So, yeah, so you have to be realistic on how you're going to sell. If you don't have time to make a lot of phone calls or you don't have the people and the volume to get those phone calls done, like you have people that are doing phone calls with you, right? It's not just you on the phone. Now I do. Um, but when I started doing retreats and, and for the first year, I filled up all my retreats with my, myself. But, you know, my retreats were 10 people. 
every yeah. other month ish. So that's not that many calls, you know, with a 30% closing rate, I'm looking at 60 call. No, I'm sorry, 30 calls to get 10 people in the room. That's right. not that much. Right. You've got a near closing rate ratio. And a lot of times people will say, well, I have 200 people on my email list, so I'll probably get at least 50 people to the event. I'm like, no, you'll be lucky if you can get 20 people to even open the email and then maybe a sprinkle of people to actually pay attention and or come to a call with you, unfortunately. So it it is a numbers game, I find. Now, if you got on the phone with most of those 200 people, that's a whole different story. Or if you left voicemails and stuff, that's a whole different story. But a lot of you were just trying to email them about it and it's not working. And that's why, um, because people aren't paying attention and emails are getting lost these days. So you yeah. can't rely on email, even direct mail, do direct mail. I've done postcards to get people to my events. It doesn't always, you know, convert a ton, but it's at least they're seeing it. Whereas they may not be seeing the email. So, I would say that one of the things to keep in mind is that a mix of methods, like it's, it's people want this one method that's going to drive a hundred people. And I say, it's more likely that you're going to have a hundred methods that drive one people person each, you know, like, so mixing it up, having the, the, the phone calls together with the postcards. We used to print out postcards for our summit and, and put them in boutiques all over Miami. So you know, email, postcards, phone calls. We do something called Sly Broadcast, which is a voicemail messaging uh, system where you can send a voicemail to people's phones. You know, we've done partner promos. We've had chambers of commerce that we partner with. You know, we do affiliate stuff. Like we do all these different ways. And I, you know, and each one of those will drive five, ten percent you know, with the bulk of them actually coming from our email list back when we were doing big events. And when I do these retreats, the number one strategy that we use for putting people into our retreats is, is really speaking, is, is me getting in front of an audience. And then from that, the call to action being here, get on our list, but also, hey, if you wanna have a phone call about how it looks to work with us, like sign up right here for, for a strategy session. And those, right. you know, that's really our number one method of filling our small events. Yeah, I, I totally agree with all of that. So. So yeah, okay. Oh, we could sit here for another hour. A lot. I think, I mean, wow, we covered everything yeah. that I had on my list. We have our little checklist here about hosting, marketing, and monetizing are the main three things we wanted to look at today. And I think we did give a lot of little nuggets about a lot of that stuff. And of course there's more, right? There's always more to know. And I would say you don't want to plan an event. If you want to make twenty to $100,000 anywhere in there from your event or at your event, you better get with someone who's done it and can show you how. Because otherwise, it, you might be lucky to make a, walk out with you know, any teeny amount of profit. So I would be careful and hesitant. Um, and I think it's so important if you are going to do a big event to hire somebody to run the event for you. I just think it's such a mistake to try to do all the logistics and production on your own. Um, I did it for, for years and it, like I said, I think it shaved years off my life. I think it's so valuable to find someone like a Carla who's on the line right now, who can, you know, who can take that part off your plate so that you can focus on selling into the event, selling sponsorships to the event and working on your offer at the event for the back end. So often I would get caught up in planning and producing and all that, all that nitty gritty stuff. And then wouldn't, wouldn't plan my offer until the night before. And that's like, oh my God, that's like the whole, the whole value of the event. Like the profit of it is dependent on this offer. And then I don't sketch it out till the night before. That's crazy talk. So, you know, I highly recommend considering getting mentorship as Katrina said around the event and also support with the production piece. Yeah and the marketing, and the graphics, and the copywriting, and the website, <laughs> and the this. And now you can see why I like the small events personally. <laughs> right. So pick your model, and then pick a mentor that can show you, honestly. Um, and then try some different things, I'd see, and you'll find your niche. I really love doing events. And they, sometimes people will do them, and they might not be for them after they do a couple. Um, I was the opposite of you. I hired an event planner from the get-go, and 
Uh, I had one that was so amazing. She would calm me down in the back of stage. She would give me the words sometimes. It was amazing. Wow. And then, oh, I have, if I have a 30, if I have more than 30 people in the room, which um, I do often, I'll bring some helpers, but it's not a lot to set up or produce anymore right. for me because we've done them for our years. But in the beginning, thank God I had somebody to help me because it was too much. Like if the audio didn't work, you don't have time to go talk to the hotel. So you got to have people. All right. We just keep coming up with funny things to talk about. Okay. So let's tell them how they can get more from each of us if they're interested. I know some people are probably still hanging out going, okay, 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 we want to know how. And, uh, and so Michelle, why don't you I tell do. them what you can do uh, for them and where to go, and then I'll tell them. Sweet. So my website is superstaractivator.com, and what we are focused on is really activating superstars to uplift humanity and do that through their education, their inspiration, their expertise, and especially through um, retreats. That's um, we're just now releasing in a couple of months. Um, actually, in a couple in a week or so, we're retreating. We're, we're um, releasing our retreats to riches roadmap, which is a quick start guide to how to monetize, how to create, fill, and monetize retreats. And then we're uh, my retreats to riches ebook is coming out in a couple months. So, if either of those are interesting to you. Go to our website, sign up for the list, and you'll be able to get, um, you know, get a, an announcement when they come out. And if you're interested in having a conversation with someone on my team about our programs, like our actual what we do and how we deliver our our mentoring and our and our support for for people like you, then um, you'll just on that page on that superstaractivator.com, just click book a call with the program specialist, and and that call will be pretty much a a strategy call. It's we. It's it's definitely meant to help us identify people who enroll in our events, but we don't treat it as like a salesy thing. It's very much about helping you get to a place of more clarity and perspective and and insight. And then if it's a fit, um, we can tell you about our programs. But it's very low key, low pressure, uh, not salesy at all. As you'll find, you'll discover that for yourself. That's how we roll. Awesome. Oh, thanks, Joanne. She says, "You ladies rock." <laughs> Hello, Anne. Hello. All right. Hello. So Hello. make sure while we're talking, you go put your link and stuff in the, in the comments. And then okay. so for me, I was just thinking as she was talking, like, what can I give that isn't already out there for those of you who are paying? I love it when people pay attention. I'm all about pay attention, people. Right? There's so many people that aren't paying attention these days. They don't take the time to watch a Facebook Live. They don't even take the time to read a post or an email blast or whatever. And frankly, you're missing out. If you need to make a lot more money in your business, that's the people I want to talk to. I want to talk to you if you want to create more income for yourself because it could be about anything, whether it's an event or you want to get a book out. Um, first of all, books don't make a lot of money. I just launched my book. But um, they're a great uh, <laughs> expert status creator and all that. Mm -hmm. um, so I love the nitty gritty, you guys. I love showing you the every little nitty gritty thing about whether it's doing an event, your marketing, what to say, what to send, how to post, what to do, what technology, what software, all the little things, the details that will sometimes be overwhelming and will make you freeze and not get something done. So that is the kind of stuff I love to do. I actually, before this live, got off of my two-hour masterclass. So I do a two-hour masterclass once a month where you can actually come and get laser coaching like this. So if you were on the line right now, I'd be giving you everything I've got for what advice I have to give you for whatever it is you wanted to know more about. And it's 79 bucks. So you can go get that. The next one is October 19th. So October 19th is Friday. It's a Friday from 9 to 11 Pacific. You can go sign up for that right now under my events page at jumpstartyourmarketing.com. Um, you can get some free stuff too. If you want free, you know, raise your hand. But I thought I would give away, if anybody wants to private message me, just click my name and private message me in Facebook. And I will send you an event checklist. So what you, things you want to think about in setting up your event, before, during, and after stuff of your event. I also have a three-part video series. I want that. <laughs> I also have a three-part video series on 
events. So before, during, and after an event about the nitty gritty stuff that you need to do and think about. Um, they're all actually on YouTube, but if you send me a private message, I'll find them for you because I have hundreds of videos on YouTube. Um, and I'm also gonna throw in my three-year entrepreneur evolution plan roadmap. So it's actually a graphic, it's super cool. Um, one of my clients, Alicia White, designed it, and it shows you like the first year in business, and some of you might be beyond this, but when you're ramping your business up or jump-starting your business, I like to say, and you need more clients, you need more money, you're still in that first three years of your business, whether you are or not, technically, because all the things that I teach are not in place. Otherwise, you would be making a lot more money. So we have to kind of go through the roadmap and find out the holes and the opportunities of the things that are missing, the things that you still need to take advantage of or put in place or implement or delegate or systematize so that you have more of a smooth running, consistent money making machine. So we will find those holes, we will find those opportunities, we will fill them and plug them up so that you can just see a much more consistent revenue generating business. So you'll get the roadmap, the event checklist, and the three part video series um, if you private message me. And uh, because I check my private messages <laughs> myself, so it's not an assistant, it'll be me. Um, and if you just comment on the post, then the post will get lost and I can't see all my notifications. So I can't necessarily do say, you know, I'll check the notifications because I get hundreds and hundreds of notifications and I never see all my notifications. See you, Michelle? Oh my God, it's overwhelming. No, yeah. Well, I, I prefer private messages too. Exactly. All right. So tons of stuff. Thanks you guys for watching. Words. I don't see any last minute questions, but hi. The only guy on the whole call, Keith. Thank you for coming. <laughs> no, Jake was on here for a while. Oh, yeah, Jake, Jake yeah. probably just came and said hi and left, I'm guessing. But he's so busy. <laughs> thank you, Jake. All right. Um, well, thanks um, so much, Michelle, for agreeing to do this. I love, love, love hanging out with friends on Facebook Live. and, uh, and we'll Super have fun. All right. I'm excited to do more with you. Thanks, Katrina. Bye, you guys. Okay, bye.